Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. I'm Peter Bergon, and it's go time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. We are back. It is episode 25 of Go Time. Today's sponsors are Minio and Backtrace. On the panel today, we have myself, Eric St. Martin. We also have Carlicia Campos. Say hello, Carlicia. Hi, ever- <laughs> Hi everybody. <laughs> And Brian is off uh, doing some training and stuff. So Scott Mansfield from Netflix has joined us today as part of the panel. Say hello, Scott. Hello, Scott. (laughs) (laughs) You you actually took that literally. (laughs) That works. So and our special guest today uh, joining us on the panel is Peter Bergand. Say hello, Peter. Hello. And I am not special in any way. You are special. Peter is like a staple in the Go community. You've, you've been giving people advice on running Go in production like longer than most people have known about Go. You spoke to what, 2014 on advice for running uh, Go in production? Was that the first GopherCon 14? That was the first, yeah, that was the first GopherCon. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was us back then, SoundCloud days. So you want to give everybody kind of a, a little background and backstory for anybody who's not familiar with you and kind of the stuff you work on? Sure. Um, I came to Go after a relatively long career doing C++, actually. So I was one of the few people that actually tracked how Rob and the original crew thought people might come to Go. Um, I was writing mostly network servers, I guess. I was working at the time in kind of a distributed search space. And when Go was released, I happened to be on a sort of sabbatical. So I got to spend a lot of time with it in the early days, and it really piqued my interest. And I had a lot of fun doing some introductory projects. I think my first thing that I ever did was probably something that a lot of people start with. I, I, I tried to think of an algorithm that would really benefit from concurrency. And so I thought, hey, I, I, I know I'll imp- implement a naive quick sort. And I think I gave like each partition task or something its own Go routine. And I got really annoyed that it was actually slower. Uh, than doing it all in a single in a, in a single go routine has anyone on the panel ever tried something like that before like first attempts and being quite disappointed with how it turned out uh i'm trying to think of some of the original ones see this is where like i start to fall into your same memory problem like mm-hmm. i vaguely remember some stuff but what was it um i mean i know there's some things with my own misunderstanding of the language that kind of fell flat yeah. Um, but I don't know whether implementing like a specific algorithm, I can think of a, an exact. So I struggled with the concurrency stuff for a little while. Um, my pet project at the time was this synthesizer thing, which never really got anywhere. But I started off by sending um, like individual float 32s down a channel. That doesn't work. <laughs> you need to <laughs> you need to buffer those up anyway. So I, I dug in and um managed to introduce it at my next job in a small capacity and became even more interested and started building a lot of typical sort of things out like a proxy. I think my first project that stuck around was this um, key value store. Like I guess everyone either does that or a web router, like one of the two things. (laughs) And then I joined SoundCloud where I was able to do it kind of full time. And there were already a couple of people already working in Go at SoundCloud, actually. Uh, they formed the original Berlin Go users group back in, I guess that was 2011, late 2011. Yeah, which was, if I'm, my memory serves, and, and it doesn't, but if my memory serves, that was pre 1.0. So that was back in like the R59 days. Does anyone remember those? I, I remember those. I remember make files. Oh yeah. Like no no go tool. Make files. No go tool. GC, 6G, 6L. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we built out um in at SoundCloud, we built out uh, sort of an in- internal platform that was all in Go. Uh I was on a team that did some again, it happened to be the search team, the discovery team, all of our internal infrastructure and applications were written in Go. And there were a couple of other teams scattered throughout the company that uh really liked to go. 
at that early stage. I think some of them were in the border. So like in the, uh, the internet facing teams, there were some in the transcoding teams. Um, yeah, so Go services were kind of scattered throughout. So we built up a relatively good background of um, early Go sort of tips and tricks. And we made a lot of mistakes and corrected for them. And all of that information, I conducted some interviews and, and scraped some ideas together from uh, different teams throughout the company. It was about probably interviewed about six or eight different teams back then. And, and that those interviews and, and those learnings became the basis of that first talk at the first GopherCon. So it's interesting. You like uh, you've kind of spoken about like kind of like the horror stories, right? Like being disappointed or like things that we you know we've done incorrectly. I'd I'd actually like to like circle back to some of those. Like, does everybody have an example of one that they remember like that like went horribly wrong? Like uh, something you viewed about the language incorrectly and used incorrectly, and it kind of fell flat. I know personally, I abused channels like no tomorrow in the early go days. Like. I see code that I wrote back then and I'm just very disappointed in myself. <laughs> like, why did I think that that was a good idea? Super common, I think. I, I th yeah, I think so too. I don't know. I, when I came in to go, things were already rolling and a lot of people to give advice. So when I started writing channels the first time, I quickly got advice to just use a mutex here. You don't need it. So I was like, oh, that's a thing. <laughs> and I looked into it. I'm like, okay. You can't use channels all the time. Yeah, I would use them for state. I'm lucky that most of my beginning code is in the same project that I'm still working on, so it's all been kind of rewritten. That just erases that bad memory. <laughs> you don't have to look at it anymore. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and that, well, that's the hard part, too, is like if you put stuff out in the open source world, it kind of like lives on forever, even past the point where like you look at it and you're like, yeah, nobody should be using this. <laughs> I don't know if I remember any specific horror story, but I definitely remember it took me a long time to really grok uh, the subtleties of interfaces. Yeah, I'd agree too. Um, I, I, so I always forget what the exact error is, but one of the confusing parts for me was um, in the early days with interfaces when you'd pass something as a value or a pointer and it needed a pointer receiver. Like if you passed it, if it expected a pointer um, receiver on the method, it would it would work. But if you passed a value, it wouldn't work. And you get an error. And there was always confusion, like why that didn't work until I yes. until I looked into actually how interfaces are built. Like when you look at them, there's actually a value inside of it, as well as a pointer to the type. So it's like, well, it can make a pointer to the value, but it can't make a value from the pointer or vice versa. So that used to mess with me all the time because I'd be like, well, why can't, why does it work one way, but not the other? Somebody gave a talk about that. One of the Go language uh, team members, I forgot who, and um, there was a good explanation. But yeah, it's not, it's not easy. It's not something that is, you don't find the, this information right away. I, I don't think when you start learning, even now. Well, I mean, I guess it, it exists in the form of the language spec, right? So that's like actually a really good place like and the memory model. Um, I remember reading the memory model and that started solidifying a lot of concepts to me, like about ordering how the compiler can actually reorder your statements. So you can't actually guarantee when this is run concurrently that these things are going to happen before each other just because you put them in the code that way. And that really started helping with my knowledge. But I think you have to have some experience like you kind of have to find your way around first and develop some battle scars and then read it because then you have something to relate it to yeah totally right like if you just you read the language spec and the memory model you're like okay and then you're going to still make the same mistakes yeah i agree this is something I, a, a trap i find myself falling into whenever i'm trying to teach newcomers or like give advice sometimes oh everything i learned was a function of my doing it the wrong way once and then kind of realizing it's the wrong way. It's a very didactic process. And I think most people probably work in a similar way. So it's not actually very helpful to just tell them this is the right way you're doing it wrong. You have to kind of show them what the problems are and let them feel the pain, so to speak. Yeah, I know that I, I never actually learn any new language or any new concept without going and implementing something in that language or just trying to implement that concept. It just doesn't stick. 
Yeah, there's there's that balance. Like, how do you get enough knowledge to not be totally falling on your face, but be developing enough uh, battle scars from doing it where you can kind of start to understand what's going on? And talking about learning and teaching, Peter, I see that you are now giving workshops. Do you plan to continue? And how's that going? Yeah, um, I guess there's a couple of topics that are sort of in my wheelhouse, and it depends on the audience. Um, I've given basically uh, Go training from from zero and kind of a, a tour of the language and get you up to gets the class up to you know reasonably sophisticated Go programming. And I in in that course, I just walk through all the language features and do some tour exercises and yeah, step through docs like the memory model and effective Go and explain how all the sort of orthogonal pieces interact. So I've done that a couple of times uh, in different settings and different links. And that's okay. That's kind of rewarding. The main thing for me is just to get more people like into the ecosystem. And maybe this is hubris, but kind of point them at down the right paths rather than, you know, encouraging them to build yet another HTTP request muxer or whatever the thing may be. There's maybe more interesting projects to get your feet wet with. Uh, and then lately, I've been doing quite a lot of stuff around uh, the topic of microservices. And GoKit comes into play there, absolutely. But I think that there's also another way to look at teaching the language, a very sort of service-oriented or server-oriented way of a, approaching an introduction to the language that seems to me to get a bit more traction in the sense that people more quickly understand the strengths and the values of Go. And they kind of say, oh, um, this actually compares very favorably to how I have to currently do things in Python, let's say, or in you know Spring Boot or, or whatever the framework of the day is. And um, yeah, these are, these are quite popular workshops, especially at um, kind of typical conferences like uh, GoTo or QCon or some that I've done lately. I love that idea. I wish you would uh, maybe write about it. Is there a book in the works, maybe? <laughs> a book, good <laughs> lord. <laughs> You're putting work on his plate for him. <laughs> You're committed now. <laughs> I'm delegating. <laughs> Goodness. No, it really, it truly is to me, I think, uh, very useful to, to have an approach to teaching the language that highlights its best features. You know, there are many ways of teaching things, and I think people make use of different ways. In this uh, way of teaching that, I don't remember exactly how you said it, but in, like presenting the language in a way that it's a, how did you say it, in a service-oriented way? Through the lens of servers, yeah. Right, because it's so much of what we do, and especially what we do with Go. So it's super useful. Yeah, I totally agree. So the microservices thing has kind of like an, been another explosion uh, in recent years too, and we see a lot of frameworks in many different languages and orchestration platforms and service discovery and things like that. So mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about that and kind of your passion for that, because you've kind of been in that world for almost as long as you've been Go. Yeah. Kind of learning and, and building your, your view of the world and how it should work and advocating to people how to do this successfully. Yeah, I guess there's two angles on this. There's the why is it interesting to me at a sort of a high level? And then there's the why is why do I think Go is a great match at a technical level? Um, so I'll start with the first, I guess. I was really um, doing microservice type stuff for quite a long time. Of course, it didn't have that name until very recently. Um, I really only dove into what we commonly know as microservice workloads uh, today when I was at SoundCloud and we kind of made a executive decision, or at least an engineering department decision, that this was probably going to be the future and we should probably invest some resources into building out an architecture that worked in this manner. And at the beginning, I was just, I think, the first team that was using our internal platform and kind of the prototype customer. But I was really excited to try it out because it got at something that I couldn't quite put to words at the time but which I really uh, have thought a lot about now. And I, and I think I can describe it properly now that it's, I'm a few years removed. And that is this experience I had in previous companies where it would be my first day on the job or first week or something. And I would join a team and there would be this existing code base that was just, to my eyes, massive. And 
like full of dark corners and unexpected interactions and a lot of legacy, not necessarily cruft, but just the legacy knowledge kind of baked into it. And the only way to become comfortable in that environment was to put in a whole lot of grunt work that you couldn't really rush and you couldn't really optimize. You had to read the code, but that was never enough. You had to go and ask people why things were the way that they were and um, sort of probe them with intelligent questions about, well, did you consider this alternative? Oh, you, I, okay, you did, and it didn't work out for these reasons. What implications does that have on this other part of the system? And so for me, it was always a multi-month process to get my head around a new system. And what I sort of discovered with microservices was that the, this cost was dramatically reduced when the size of an individual code base with like sort of well-defined boundaries was much, much smaller. It's code that uh, in, in my workshops, I say uh, one good definition of a microservice is code that you can keep in your head. And I think that's a really great way to sort of delineate uh, a boundary for this sort of thing. It's code that you can totally keep in, in your, um, you know, your layer two cache in your brain or whatever. And that implies that you can pretty well describe it with a single sheet of paper and, you know, 15 minutes to a coworker. And maybe there are some, a couple of like edge cases and, and dark corners in there, but it's not the sort of stuff you need to dedicate half a year to figuring out. And if this is true, if, if this is how your organization's kind of uh, built uh, as like a, a loose constellation of these sorts of code bases, then it's much easier to move between them, to understand them, to understand the interaction points, at least for me, at least for the way I model software. And in turn, it becomes, um, it, it gives you a lot more confidence when you join a new team or you start a new project or you take over an existing project to refactor it, perhaps, uh, if, if the requirements change or to, or to make um, changes and, and maintain it and have confidence that you're doing that in the right way. So that's sort of the soft side. It's why I love microservices. They make me confident again, and they give me sort of a certain amount of happiness that I had lost when I was working on gigantic sort of years old legacy monoliths or, or huge projects like that. That was a lot of talking. I'm sorry for taking the floor. <laughs> it, it, it's your floor to take. <laughs> Goodness. Uh, that was a great explanation. And I, I love it that this idea of uh, the ideal size of a, of a code base being whatever amount that you can hold it in your head as a mental model. This, comes, this has been coming up over and over again when we talk about micro, microservices. I think it applies to a lot of things, though, too. Like recently, I was talking to some people at KubeCon last week, the week before, and I used almost the same um, premise where it was, you know, whether or not you should use something like Kubernetes, like an orchestration platform. And my example was if, if, you, can't, if you can't name me all of your host names, then you can't say like Chicago Web 01 through 30, like that doesn't count, right? <laughs> but like if you can't reasonably like name off all of your hosts, you probably shouldn't be managing them individually. You should you should be doing something to to orchestrate those and provision them and manage them at a higher level of abstraction. So I think that that's the reasonable thing. And and management too, right? Like from your perspective, like when you have an organization with a big monolithic project, it takes a lot more coordination between teams that are seemingly unrelated, but because now they're in the same code base, they have to be the projects are more coupled tightly coupled together than they need to be. Mm. Yeah. And as, as ever, it's this balance, right? There's a spectrum between, uh, I, I like this word balkanization where everything is its own separate service. You can take that to an extreme, of course. Oh yeah. And you just have to look at the architecture diagrams from Uber or whatever. It's like a thousand microservices, many of which are duplicated because teams just don't know about, uh, existing functionality necessarily. So you can definitely take it too far. And this is, and now I guess we're getting a bit to the technical side. And this is a point that I'm very clear to make whenever you move away from a monolith or you start down this path of giving each team or perhaps each developer a set of their own independent microservices to manage, you're actually creating way more technical problems for yourself in so many dimensions than you're solving. And what microservices enable is sort of like organizational harmony and they improve shipping velocity and they improve communication overhead and exactly as you said um, coordination in a single code base when that becomes too hard then microservices can help 
So let me give you a counterpoint to this kind of argument. Um, you can do the same thing in a big monolith. You have very well-defined interfaces, for example, between groups of packages. Uh, and then you don't have to worry about the vagaries of going over the network every time you want something. So what, what do you say to that? Absolutely. I think the, the, the term that gets batted around for that architecture is the elegant monolith style, where um, everything is pretty well delineated internally. And like there's no um, not a lot of shared code, very well defined API boundaries. It's just that you're not um, the, the deployment artifact is it's all hosted in a single process, which carries a huge number of advantages, um, atomic refactors and the deployment story is significantly easier. The testing story is way easier. Yeah, so this is a great thing to do, especially if you're just getting started. Um, when I give my little workshops, I say, if you're, I don't know, five engineers or fewer, there's no reason that you should be running a microservice architecture. You're just not hitting any of the problems that microservices solve. And um, this, this architecture you describe is a great, great alternative and one that you can kind of adapt to microservices as um, you grow and become more successful. Yeah, I saw uh, Peter Burgon, Peter's talk at Golang UK, and he was very discouraging of using microservices. <laughs> <laughs> and I really liked it because he went through, you know, all the pain points, some obvious, not, some not so obvious. Obviously, he has a ton of experience. And he went through a many pain, pain points that you can go through by having a microservice if you are not really properly set up for it, like you were saying, if you're super small, you don't need to divide your code base in many microservices. Um, but at the same time, Scott's comments, remark is uh, to the point, I think, because as I have been learning more about packaging in Go in the recent months, Go is, uh, makes, makes it so easy to really contain your code through the use of packages. So I, I, you know, I, I wonder if for Go, the heuristics will be different as far as the sizing of uh, a feasible size for a code base. Do you think it would be bigger or smaller, Carlesia? Yeah, I'm wondering if, if it could not be bigger and still, and still be very functional just because the if you use the features of the packaging and now there is like that internal feature which allows you to hide even more things oh uh, yeah and there are companies using monolithic apps like uh, digital ocean and there is another one that i forgot now yeah i think it's completely viable um there's uh, there's so many i mean i i guess i don't have the stamina to give my workshop again here but there's so many problems that come when you have different uh, when, you, when you're splitting your business domain along um, process boundaries, uh, if you can avoid doing that, if you can split it on package boundaries and then wire things up internally with some inter-process or intra-process communication layer rather than JSON over HTTP or whatever. Um, yeah, and package boundaries make a good proxy for that sort of thing. Although then you start entering this... Uh, Still, like, quite confusing for me. Domain of of how do you structure your repo? How do you like? How do you decide where to cut up your packages? And Ben Johnson has an opinion about this, but I've tried to use it and it often fails for me. Maybe I'm holding it wrong. There's lots of opinions about this sort of thing. I'd love to sort of hold a panel about that as well. I would too. I am super interested in that. By the way, the other company I was thinking about was Google. <laughs> the, the Google has a uh, single repo. Um, but yeah, so Ben Johnson was talking about that. Uh, Bill Kennedy promised that he's going to start writing about that as well. I'm working on a talk and a blog post about uh, packaging, although mine is going to be more like entry level than one of you guys. But um, personally, I can't even imagine working with a mono repo. Uh, just the whole, you know, deploy everything every time run every single test every, every time or at least once in a while. Uh, I can't imagine. It depends on how coupled your, your repos are. You know, if you, have, if you have multiple repos that are highly coupled to each other, then the testing story and deployment story gets more complicated with that too. So I think it's interesting because the mono repo can still be broken up, right? So like if you look at, say, like the Kubernetes code base or the Docker code base as an example, right, there's a command directory, which kind of has the main packages in it. 
And then there's like a package directory that has the code implementations of those things. So there's still areas of the repo that are kind of siloed off for these particular things. But you can guarantee that, you know, when you make changes to the, you know, kube control binary, which is the command line interface for interacting with Kubernetes, you, you can ensure that it doesn't break against, you know, new versions of stuff when it's all tested together. Cool. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's really hard, though, because anybody who's worked for companies large and, and small, you start thinking, well, it's good for these scenarios, but bad for these others. And you can join the other team depending on kind of what the, the exact use case is, because I, I love mono repos for some reason, for many reasons. And then I love, you know, splitting it up for others. And I, I feel like there's no easy win either way. And I feel the same way about breaking up packages, like where the package boundaries are defined. As long as I've been doing this, I still can't find a way that I like. I feel like, you know, this worked for this one time, but it's terrible for another mm. uh, project. And it sounds like that's a struggle everybody's having. I haven't seen Ben Johnson's post on what he's recommending there. At least I don't remember it. It might be my seven day window thing. <laughs> I need to look at that. That's on his, what, Medium blog? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he has, a, he has a blog post and he has... Um... Yeah, exactly. A repo with an example, and actually, if you look through the, um, I think a, a pull request, there is quite a instructional conversation between Peter and Ben going over the trade-offs. It's very interesting. One thing is for sure, a, a mono repo would make it easy for dependency. Um, so maybe we should talk about that. Yeah, and so yeah, I want to get into dependencies and I want to get into GoKit a bit. Yeah, but before we do that. It is time for our first sponsor break. So our first sponsor for this episode is Minio. And Minio is a better alternative to ZFS and ButterFS like file systems. And unlike file systems, which have POSIX file APIs, Minio speaks Amazon S3 compatible RESTful APIs. So you can interact with it from your application much like you would AWS's object storage service. If you have a need for a low cost but highly available storage cluster powered by an object storage S3 compatible overlay, Minio is for you. Um, they have SDKs which are available in Go, Python, JavaScript, and Java. Um, and they also support Amazon Lambda compatible event driven programming. So they have support for things like Redis, Elasticsearch, Postgres, uh, Kafka, uh, NATS. It's useful for on-demand compute functions like thumbnail generation, antivirus scanning, and metadata extraction. And for and all of the DevOps people, uh, Minio uh, and Kubernetes actually allow you to build kind of uh, massive multi-tenant cloud storage environments. And if you use Mesosphere or Docker Swarm, they also have you covered. Head to Minio.io to learn more. And thanks to our friends at Minio for supporting the show. Okay, so moving on. Carlicia, you wanted to talk about dependency management. Dependency management. That little thing. <laughs> that, uh, that tiny little problem nobody has, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Peter, I know you have a lot of views on this and uh, some of the tooling and and how things have evolved, and you've kind of followed this all the way through its course, which has been as long as it's solved. Quite on the contrary, I, I actually have almost no strong opinions about it. Um, I mean, what I do have a strong opinion about is that it gets solved. Yeah, precisely. precisely. So how did this all begin? Back in the early days, in the pre 1.0 days, we all decided um, we should go get our dependencies. And because go get identifies projects in sort of a spatial dimension, they identify them by name. But provide no way to identify them in sort of a time dimension. There's no way to identify a version. The consequence was that we kind of all just had to trust that all of our dependencies were going to remain stable or the changes they make weren't going to be breaking. Or if they did make breaking changes, that we would catch it sort of somehow magically as soon as it happened and then make changes to fix it somehow magically. And this um, hope-driven development uh, works surprisingly well for a number of years in the sense that Go gained popularity and people were still shipping productive production software with it. But in the open source ecosystem, it, it has sufficient differences to the, um, to the Google mono repo and to the Google way of doing things. And so as we all are pretty much aware, I'm guessing by now, this 
has started to fall over uh, in in the in the broader ecosystem. For me, that the hardest thing to deal with was actually when I started programming against Kubernetes APIs. Has anyone tried to do that? Yes. Goodness. And ouch. <laughs> Very much ouch. Yeah, I'm building stuff against their APIs too. And two problems, right? So one is um, before they did the client go library, which is just, just the client libraries, mm. you had to import the entire Kubernetes package, which is terrible. And then the second problem is nested vendoring. Yeah. Like that, that just, yeah. So like following this course, right? Like in the early days, I almost agreed with Google, like, as eh, you don't really, but you forget that in the early days, there wasn't a lot of libraries. That's right. So you ended up writing a lot of your own stuff. So it just really wasn't a problem. And the libraries that did exist were relatively small, right? So you didn't have this. Uh, huge vendor tree problem. You didn't have this like dependencies of dependencies of dependencies problem. Exactly. Like, yeah, they, they were they were relatively small, served a, a very distinct problem, and you could either copy the one part of code you needed, or it's very small, but you didn't have like you said this tree of of vendor directories where it's like great now I have Kubernetes vendored in, but how do I get it to recognize their vendors, and what happens when they have vendored the same libraries? that I have vendored because I'm using them for different purposes and just, yeah. Exactly. So a lot of people saw this coming and a lot of really smart people started developing tools to manage the vendor directory is what we kind of all settled on as the place to store your dependencies. That's fine. You can check it in. You don't, you can not check it in. Kind of doesn't matter. But the, and, and this was kind of this approach of the, like the, the blooming of a thousand flowers by all the contributors was kind of um, blessed by the core Go people. They wanted to have the community, quote unquote, like solve this problem. And then when a solution emerged, I guess I, they didn't say this explicitly, but I guess they would have kind of like uh, blessed it somehow. And then that's what people would all choose to use. Unfortunately, that was, I think, in retrospect, quite naive because what ended up happening was we have sort of uh, 13 standards or whatever of ways to manage dependencies. And that means different file types, different file locations, different file formats, different behaviors in all the tools. And some and broadly, you can say that they do very similar things in very similar ways, but the, there's, there's subtleties in the differences. And in the end, it means that when you publish a package and you have dependencies and you want to like, I guess it's a pretty sane thing to want to do. You want to like uh, bind your code with specific versions of its dependencies, then you're necessarily kind of opting into one of these tool ecosystems, but there's so many that in order to like consume different packages, you end up having to support kind of all of them. And since none of them are part of the standard Go tooling, then you're kind of like telling your consumers you, they need to opt into not only the Go tool, but like these other third party things, which have their own like project life cycles and bugs and all these things. And so it's, it's, a, it's a total mess. And while you can always like find a path through the uh, storm and, and um, solve something for your specific uh, use case or for your specific project, there's no single coherent, like teachable way, simple way to, to solve this problem generally. And so that was the state of the world. Even if, even if we all as a panel said you should use this one, it's not going to matter because like that whole nested dependency problem, right? Like I use one, but I import a package that uses another one and just, it, yeah, it's. So I think it, it was super naive in retrospect to say the community is going to figure it out because what happened was you had these camps and they kind of ossified and for good reasons, everyone has, you know, reasonably good reasons for choosing one style or another, but now I have all these competing standards. So in my mind, the only way out of this is to, and, and then I guess this is where we're getting, uh, form a committee with representation from the core team and pick a standard. And maybe that takes the form of blessing one of the existing tools officially, or maybe it takes a form of kind of like producing a hybrid tool or a, a common tool or something like that. And uh, this is the sort of committee that I was driving as of a couple months ago. And um, that's what we're in the process of doing right now is to kind of eliminate this um, heterogeneity in this space.
and hopefully help a lot of people. So just to get things clear, you're not the head of the committee anymore? Yeah, right. So I was never on the committee. Um, basically, what happened was a number of weeks at my, at my day job where I was working with um, people trying to get a handle on the um, dependency management story and just being confronted with all these tools and workflows. And they were broken for our use cases in subtle ways. And we filed bugs and people were just getting like pissed off frankly. And many of them were, uh, and, and I saw this also in the broader community, kind of like saying, you know what, I'm not interested in programming Go anymore if this is the way it's going to be. And this was really like super sad for me. So I just kind of said, you know, forget it. I think I have enough political capital in the Go community that I can kind of anoint myself um, the person who's going to figure this out. But I don't have enough political or technical know-how to um, actually do it myself. So I said, I'm going to like be sort of the communications director or the PR person, and I'm going to organize a committee of people whom everyone trusts, hopefully, and they're going to figure it out. And I'm just going to be sort of the organizational person. I'm going to, I'm going to run interference and try to be a firewall and um, help them achieve that goal. So yeah, I'm not on the committee. Uh, I'm just figuring out all the logistics, I guess. All right. So you're still heading there. So. Yeah, a lot of you. You're heading the initiative. Yeah, I, you could say that. And what is the state of the prototype that's being built? Is it, has it been made open? Uh, not yet, not yet. So the, the workflow was we first, uh, in a Google Doc, described what I want the process to be. We took some feedback on that. That was great. Then we picked the committee, and it actually ended up being a core committee of Andrew Durand, uh, Jesse Frizzell, um, Ed Muller, and Sam Boyer whom you know from the extremely lengthy, uh, so you want to build a package manager medium article. I think it was like estimated reading time, 45 minutes or something like <laughs> <Yeah>. this. <laughs> super, super excellent article. Uh, so they're the core committee. And then we have like this sort of trusted uh, advisory group of the authors and maintainers of the, of the top four tools at the moment, which are Matt Farina of Glide, Daniel Theophanes. I'm sure I'm butchering that name. I'm sorry, Daniel. Uh, he's the Go vendor chap, Dave Cheney of GB, which is kind of the uh, odd duck in the group. And then Steve Francia, who is kind of like a, a Go liaison now at Google. And he's been doing a lot of work in the space as well. So it's these people that are sort of driving it. And yeah, sorry to answer your question. The implementation is currently underway. We, we went through a long period of building a spec for the thing, got some feedback on that. And the implementation's now like uh, basically being implemented, a, a prototype implementation by this core committee. And that's not open yet because we want to have something at least minimally usable before we um, make the repo public. Yes. Yeah, sure. So, and to clarify, so this is going to be kind of a, a new approach based on um, knowledge of people who have already developed tools and not some way of interacting with these specs that already exist. Right. So what we did was an extensive, comprehensive survey of the state of the ecosystem, both in Go and in other languages. We consulted with all of the authors about the pain points that they experienced and that they wanted to represent that their users experienced and what things they found to be super important, the most important, you know, top K features or whatever. And then um, we took feedback from the community based on user stories, based on design points. So there's a whole bunch of questions. Should the tool in this scenario do this or that? Should it, how should it interact with the Go path? How should it um, manage version ranges? And so on and so forth. And each of these questions has a wide variety of possible answers. So we enumerated all those as best we could. And then with this like kind of, I don't know how you'd call it, like the survey of possible use cases and design space points and use, um, user stories and all these things, we sort of winnowed it down to um, what we considered to be the, the bare minimum usable uh, covering 90% of the use case tool with, uh, it ended up being quite a small surface area, so not too many sub commands. And then we made that spec, the spec of such a tool public, and we took feedback on that. So yeah, it's sort of like lessons learned and hopefully uh, uh, a common ground between what everybody's doing. From where you stand now, Peter, what, is, what do you see as a possible timeline for this coming together 
as production ready tool for vendoring. Um, if if let's say if it goes in the path that it's going now, of course, if people say it needs to change, then God, who knows? But if it goes on a path that's going now, and people and there is agreement, and there would never be consensus, but if it proves itself useful the way it's coming along, what do you see as far as timeline? It's a great question. Uh, my hope at this point is that we're going to have a uh, we're going to have a usable prototype by the end of the year timeframe. And luckily, it's going to be um, a tool that you can kind of go get independently of anything else, and you can kind of try it out. We're going to have a period of um, use, I guess, refinement, iteration. Uh, at this point, I hope in interested members of the community are going to be filing issues and potentially even PRs on it. And then the goal, at least as I understand it now, and you know, this is all subject to change, of course. But the goal would be that this um, dependency management tool, however it's called, would become uh, packaged into the Go tool. So a, a separate Go space um, DEP, let's say, subcommand uh, in the 1.9 timeframe. So that's the hope at the moment. Um, who's to say if it's going to get there? But even if it doesn't get in the Go tool, it'll be, it'll be usable separately. I think the nice thing about it being in the Go tool is that it becomes the canonical thing people use because that's the hardest part, right? Yeah. Once this thing is released, it's just another one in the C, right? And then we're still going to have the issues of I'm using that tool, but I'm vendoring things that use another tool. And I think as soon as it's kind of adopted by the Go tool, it becomes kind of the standard and people start porting to use it. And then the ecosystem becomes friendlier for everybody. Exactly. And as someone has just, as Scott has just pasted in the uh, Slack channel, uh, the problem here is exactly the number of competing standards. Like that, the problems introduced by that, the usability problems introduced by having all these tools is exactly what needs to get fixed. And in a lot of ways, that's really, really hard because you don't want to, like, we've, we've only learned the lessons we have from all these incredibly smart people putting in the hours and the dedication to making their tools as good as they are. But at the end of the day, if you want to have a, like a, a reasonable, coherent ecosystem, you can't have like arbitrary installation instructions for every arbitrary package that you come across. You really do need the single standard. Um, and we're going to do our best to uh, make that transition period as easy as possible. There's a couple of options for that. We can read existing uh, like the the most popular file formats and kind of do the um, uh, the transition kind of automatically, or we can have a transition tool that's packaged kind of beside the 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 debt management tool or something. We haven't quite figured out what that's going to look like, but we're committed to making um, the transition UX about as good as it can be. Even if there's a, a secondary process that I have to download to just like fix my vendor directory, you know, like I don't care that you use this because I can fix that just kind of run something to that reads their vendor file and and flattens it out onto yours or however that works for example yeah the, the hard part too here is is like i think we're we're critical on the go team too like i think it was naive but i also kind of understand where they were coming from where it's not really a language thing it's an ecosystem thing but i also argue that there's many things in the language that we that were brought in as that were ecosystem things which has actually helped adoption, like the Go tool. I mean, that's, mm. I mean, everybody uses that now. And, and I mean, I think that that made the language so much more approachable when everything kind of got bundled into the Go tool. Arguably, the great lesson of the Go experiment is that you can't really treat the language and its tooling ecosystem in isolation, that they are really part of a package that developers buy into as a whole. And I think that that understanding has really uh, helped Go. and like the commitment to go rename, go fix, go fumped, um, go vet, go lint, like all these things act together in a way that makes a compelling developer experience. Are you familiar with the Rails world? <laughs> Only peripherally. Okay. So like, and I wonder like how much of what everybody loves about Go is because of the same, similar things that people love Rails for, which is like that convention over configuration thing. There's just kind of like this canonical way of doing things. and that makes it much more approachable. You're not looking at 50 ways of doing this and, and like the, um, 
paradox of choice. You know, you, you can't figure out which decision is the best. Therefore, you just don't make a decision. Mm. And the Go tooling has kind of taken that away. You know, like, well, how do I format my code? And, and you know, what, what are the proper idioms and things like that? And it's kind of well defined. It's certainly what attracted me to the language early on. Um, and what kind of drove, kept me away from, from Ruby was that um, and less so Rails, more so Ruby is that in Go and not in Ruby, there's only one way to do something, right? And that sort of, those limits paradoxically give me the, the freedom to worry about the problem domain and not about my method of expressing it. Yeah, I love that. Scott, you're firing shots from the GoTime FM channel, <laughs> aliases. <laughs> Hand grenade. Yeah. <laughs> There was one point that I wanted to bring up that I thought was um, very good in the document that is out there now for comment. Um, the, the idea of keeping this very restrictive, but also just simply dropping some of the more complex requirements, I think is going to work out for the best because keeping that area small, and that, that purview small to begin with, is going to let you actually observe in the real world what the problems are. Um, and I think too many people earlier, part of the churn, um, especially in the vendor channel on the, on the Slack, was around all these complex use cases that people could just come up with all day. Um, but having something out there and, and operating in the real world is going to get you the, the proper tool in the end. Totally agree. It's very easy to come up with a convoluted workflow that breaks any tool you can imagine. And all you have to do is stamp a required on that, on that workflow, and suddenly you're back to square zero. Right? What do, what do you do? And I think some of it comes from, you know, all of us come from different languages that already had package managers that worked a particular way. So you're influenced by it almost like you are the, the idioms that you use programming in the language. So I think that's where we see some of these patterns from all of these different tools is the influence from the package managers they came from. So and I think that the, the perceived use cases come from that too, right? So, you know, the language itself is the same way. You're like, oh, well, I need this language feature because I need to be able to do this. But really, there's another way that it can be done if you view it from the language perspective. So it's kind of the same way here. We have to think about it from Go's world. Like no, no language actually has import paths, like actual URLs is their import paths. So we're already kind of in a whole new world. So, Scott, did you want to talk about aliases or are you just... You're just throwing jokes here. Uh, no, that's purely me trolling. I really don't want to talk about aliases. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk about aliases. Uh. <laughs> have, you, have you talked about it yet on the program? Uh, there was an episode, I think we vaguely talked about it. And you know, Brian is very, very like uh, adamant that he does not want that. <laughs> Good. So, so Scott, you're supposed to be playing the part of Brian today, so you should be like, no aliases. <laughs> okay, no aliases. They're horrible. Um, I really don't understand why, but uh, I've been told so. So That ship has sailed, you guys. Yeah, I think it's just because it people think it, it creates kind of like a foot gun. It's not that it's inherently bad. It's just, you know, the language has done a very good job at shielding people from creating monstrosities, you know. You give me a day and a laptop and I can create the worst Go code you've ever seen. So I don't really need aliases to do that. Challenge accepted. <laughs> I want to see that too. I, I actually want to see like everybody's worst Go code. Like, What is the worst thing you can come up with? Like the most racy, ugly looking Perl one-liner, you know? <laughs> oh, that's something I don't miss. Did anybody work in Perl in previous lives? No, not me. Well, Peter, you wouldn't remember, right? <laughs> <laughs> I remember one of the first programming books I got was like Pearl, like CGI Pearl or something like this. I think it was an O'Reilly book. And I think I got about 15 pages in and until I gave up pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I don't miss the days where there was competition with like, you know, look, I wrote an IRC client in one line of Pearl. You're like, but, but why? I worked with a guy at Disney. We used to joke there and call it the. It was a write-only language. You didn't. You didn't modify Perl. You just wrote a new one. Exactly. <laughs> you know who's using Perl all the time? Actually, is uh, Damien. Yeah. At um, Booking.com, they're still a Perl shop. Yeah, they're doing. I think um, OOP 
Pearl, though. So, and I, I'm pretty sure that people have probably learned their lessons by now that you don't write, <laughs> you know, one line applications in one line that that's just not reasonable. Indeed. <laughs> So a big project of yours is GoKit, and I want to get into that. But first, I think we have our second sponsor break. So everybody get a drink. So, well, not everybody listening, but the people on the show. So our second sponsor for today is Backtrace. Software teams use Backtrace to take the headache and guesswork out of debugging across their environments. Backtrace jumps into action when your Go application fails by capturing detailed application state information, including the complete set of Go routines, channels, and wait duration, and scheduler information. Uh, Backtrace analyzes the state and archives it in a centralized object store, allowing you to explore interesting patterns across your errors and plug rich error data into your resolution workflow tools. Um, Backtrace is used by companies like Fastly, our CDN partner, Limelight Networks, Message Systems, AppNexus, uh, head over to backtrace.io slash go time to learn more and start a free trial. Okay, so GoKit, we, we, we started out with microservices, now we're going to circle back. So uh, along the lines of your microservices, uh, love, the past couple of years now, you've been working on a project called GoKit, which has seemed to really be taking off. Uh, and I wanted to talk a bit about that. Sure. So let me give a quick background, I suppose. Um, GoKit was born when I was at SoundCloud. We had been doing a lot. Uh, we were very heterogeneous in terms of languages, very polyglot, I guess is a way to say that. And Go had you know, great representation at the beginning. When we were growing, we um, realized in order to achieve economies of scale, we needed to kind of settle down a bit. We needed to not be deploying Haskell code to production uh, because we had about two engineers that could support that. So we um, started to, to circle around uh, certain like officially supported ecosystems. And one that everyone seemed to enjoy was Scala. There was a lot of um, great support in the Scala ecosystem. It was a very expressive language, lots of uh, int people interested in it. Uh, and Scala had this thing called Finagle, which solved a lot of, from Twitter, which solved a lot of problems that were very common to microservice sort of architectures. Another language was Go, and a lot of people really wanted to use Go, and I was kind of chief among them. But when we started deploying a lot of services, we realized that there wasn't a finagle equivalent. We would have had to write our own circuit breakers and rate limiters and um, safety stuff and load balancers and integration with our service discovery system. This was all work that needed to happen and that the Scala people kind of got for free. So in the end, um, while Go is still being used for sort of SRE type tasks, infrastructural tasks, it fell out of favor in the application domain in terms of like the business logic services that drive the platform and drive the product. And that was like super sad to me. And I didn't want that to ever happen again. I didn't want Go to get squeezed out because it didn't have support for um, this kind of architecture. So that's what birthed GoKit and that's kind of what's been driving it so far. Now, do you have a lot of users in production with it now? Do you know? Yeah, definitely some, although this is sort of the thing with open source projects. I, I haven't like tried to do an official survey or ask people to reach out to me yet, but it's really difficult for me to get a sense of who's actually using it, because I guess if I do my job right and my documentation is good and it doesn't like crash, then I, I kind of never know, right? Because all of the um, all the repos that would be importing it, like otherwise they might show up on Godoc, right, as an importer, but all the repos that would be importing it are probably private, you know? Right. So I'm definitely aware of a couple of big uses. I'm not sure how much I can say. I guess um, uh, one frequent contributor is uh, this fellow by the name of Bas Van Beek, and he's using it extensively um, in his uh, game startup. And so he's helped me a lot with um, distributed tracing and the gRPC transport side of things and a couple of other things besides. And there's definitely like I'm I'm aware of probably about a half dozen companies, uh, people from companies that have reached out to me and said they're using it extensively. Probably another dozen or so that say they're using parts of it. Uh, beyond that, it's hard to say. So uh, I can say it has a lot of stars. That's pretty much <laughs> meaningless, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the difficulty, right? And that's kind of like why we do like our free software Friday thing. Is it's like you usually only hear from people when they're having problems. If it's yeah. if it's saving the world, they're like, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I don't think the stars are so meaningful. I think it shows interest. Um, I, I was actually just looking at the GoKids channel, GoFrisLack, and it's got uh, over a thousand people 
Wow. Yeah. That's super surprising to me. Uh, and I guess actually, if you go to the Gopher Slack, like list of channels by members, I think it's like top, top five or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's crazy though. Cause when you think about it though, like in context, that's 10% of all the people in the Gopher Slack total Yeah. for one project. That's, that's good. I'm into it. Yeah. And if you take into account that a lot of people are not even active, that might be more like it's a it's a much higher percentage of the active members right and a lot of people don't hang out in all of the channels so like hanging out doesn't not being in there doesn't mean lack of participation in it too so that's always hard like how do you measure involvement in a community or in any community how many how many go programmers are there like it's hard to even guess right i mean you could be off by an order of magnitude you, you try to look at like projects or or conference attendees or things like that and make an educated guess but we'll probably all be very wrong because there's usually more people who aren't there's usually more people using a technology that aren't active in the communities than there are people involved in the communities right the, the great dark mass of um unspeaking programmers i hear it's like what 80 percent is probably a good initial estimate you only get interaction with about 20% of your users. Wow. I knew it was a big gap, but that's huge. So we're saying 80% of people who use any given technology typically aren't visible in public communities. Um, I've, I've heard that statistic bandied about. I can't put a source to it right now, but in like my intuitively, that kind of makes sense to me. That's crazy. So I know that we... Um, have talked about Go Micro too on the show too. And I'd love to get your kind of opinion on some of the other microservices frameworks and kind of how they how they relate to each other and and what you see as kind of benefits and drawbacks. Like sure. do you do you feel that you you address the problem differently, that you solve a different problem? Because sometimes we perceive problems as the same. Yeah, I would I would say so. I would say um, my approach is pretty fundamentally different to the Go Micro approach. Um, Asim, whom I, uh, again, know and by reputation, if not super well in person, um, we've had a lot of conversations in the space, obviously, uh, his, his go micro project is from where I sit. It's a, it's a lot more of a um, batteries included, um, ecosystem, I, I would say in that, uh, and I, and I'm sure this isn't so strictly true anymore, but his, the go micro approach is like. The, the way to write a microservice is by opting in to all of these um, sort of dimensions of the problem space. And the micro um, universe has point solutions for each of those dimensions. So um, I guess it's a, it's a lot more opinionated in the sense that to boot up a, a service, you're going to define, you're going to implement a particular interface with like lifecycle management methods on it. And you're going to absolutely hook it up to a service discovery system and it's going to like interact with the service discovery system. And you're absolutely going to um, have this like control plane that exists and allows you to like query the health of services. And that's going to be backed by this particular open source um, component, which you can swap out if you want, but you need something in that place. You need something doing that work. Um, so it's, it's, it's more opinionated. And as I see it, it's kind of this, this, this universe of things. Um, GoKit, in contrast, is coming from the, the angle of you already have in your organization uh, an infrastructure, and you've already chosen what you're going to use for service discovery, or maybe um, you're not using anything for service discovery. Maybe you're doing it completely manually. Uh, similarly with your transport layer, maybe you're not using gRPC. Maybe you've already standardized on Thrift, uh, and that's not a decision that you can change lightly. And GoKit is going to basically allow you to bring Go into this, into this heterogeneous infrastructure and allow you to um, write Go microservices that interact with these components that already exist. So it's a much more um, conciliatory kind of approach. It's much more like playing nicely with others approach. And uh, it's much more focused on the sort of the software architecture of the service itself. It has much uh, looser opinions about how it interacts with its environment. And yeah, like I think covering a lot of the same ground, but just with different approaches. Does that make sense at all? No, I, th I think it does perfectly. I mean, uh, and, and that's kind of where my view has always been with the, 
you know, this is micro is kind of the, here's your whole layout. Here's how you do everything. That's and right. GoKit is more of a, a framework that allows you to kind of make decisions, but kind of here's, here's some paradigms and, and ways that are known to work well together. Exactly. And kind of pick and choose. Exactly. And here's integrations with these common components, common service discovery systems, common instrumentation systems. And we're going to help you. I, whenever I give talks about GoKit, I say it's fundamentally it's about leveling up software engineering and leveling up the way you build microservices like code cleanliness, separation of concerns, uh, exclusion principles, um, inward facing dependencies, clean architecture. It's, it's about all these sort of co uh, software engineering principles applied and, and writ large. It's a lot less about um, enforcing opinions in the, in the arf architecture or infrastructural sense. That's quite the tall order. How do you mean? Um, it takes plenty of time for an organization to adopt all those things. So, I mean, um, I guess being somewhat modular would allow them to do that, but having all of that all in one go is uh, quite a lot to learn for people who don't have that uh, deeply ingrained. Having all of that meaning all of these software engineering principles or all these components? All the software engineering principles that you just named off, uh, that's, that's quite a lot for people to, to absorb if they're not already doing a lot of those things. Oh, for sure. For sure. And for that reason, I view GoKit as like more than anything else is sort of educational uh, uh, enterprise where hopefully you can kind of start easy, start simple. There's a kind of one big hurdle at the beginning, but then you can see, OK, once you get over that, um, where all the other pieces line up. Well, I think that's kind of the fun part, too, is it's almost like a recipe book, right? Like you come in here and you're like, OK. I think the first thing we need to do is solve service discovery, right? And then there's there's a list of things that are known to work well together. And it's like, okay, let's take on the service discovery aspect. Now, now, okay, we have all these services and they're communicating with each other, but how do we do distributed tracing? And like, okay, let's let's adopt that now, right? Yep. And well, what about distributed logging? And you can kind of pick these things as projects, because kind of to Scott's point, like adopting all of it at once is going to be a no go for any large organization. That's too much risk at one time. So being able to kind of pick these things out one at a time has, a, has its benefit. Whereas kind of your, your kind of newer grassroots efforts, like, like those types of projects that are popping up have a lot more freedom and flexibility to kind of just adopt as much as they want in one go because it's kind of like it's a whole new effort. Yeah, totally. And if you're a, you know, a two or three man shop and you're starting fresh on like brand new infrastructure, then maybe GoKit is, um, you know, a, a bit too much of an initial hurdle. Maybe there's too much there and maybe you get a lot more productivity by um, starting with something like GoMicro where a lot of the decisions are already kind of laid out for you. I think that's totally viable. The other thing I want to point out, just like looking through the list of all the things that are available kind of in GoKit, the list of components is four years ago, we were writing almost all of our Go code from scratch. And now like you don't have, like, nobody, nobody's implementing new service discovery mechanisms really, right? Like those things already exist. Like it's just, I hope not. it's just crazy to think that stuff, that things that four years ago, everybody had to build for themselves. We just don't even worry about it anymore. And when you see somebody build it for themselves, you're like, but why? <laughs> so now Peter, give us some insights here as far as, interoperation between GoKit and other things or uh, self-written codes. Can you use GoKit, uh, let's say logging, mm -hmm. you know, together with micro or together with my own codes or just metrics? Is it possible? Yeah, totally. So in GoKit, um, there's a bunch of packages. And I would broadly say that there's two types of packages. There's ones that you can use completely independent of anything else um, that you can drop into your existing code base with no other changes and just reap the benefits of that particular package. And so logging is a great example. Chris Hines, who was an early contributor and who uh, basically should take all the credit for everything good in logging. Um, we worked together and, and he drove the creation of this uh, unified logging interface, which I think is um, really wonderful to use. It's like structured logging. We are strongly opinionated that structured logging is the way you should do logging in, in this sort of um, in this sort of environment. And uh, a bunch of supporting 
infrastructure around it. So you can use that package completely independently and uh, bias, but you should. You should definitely look into using that. Same thing with metrics, for example. The instrument instrumentation package um, defines a set of common interfaces that are broadly applicable and um, implementations that connect it to, I think the latest count was eight or nine common uh, metric and instrumentation systems, um, Prometheus being chief among them in my view. So, so this stuff you can use, this type of stuff you can use right away. There's other packages that sort of rely on your microservice being structured in a particular way using the uh, endpoint abstraction and the transport abstraction. And this requires a bit more buy-in. That's kind of the hurdle I was talking about. But if you jump over that hurdle, if you buy into these abstractions that I've laid out, then you get to leverage things like distributed tracing with um, implementations, integrations with uh, Zipkin and, and AppDash and the LightStep ecosystem and open tracing and all this stuff. You get to leverage circuit breakers and rate limiters and um, a number of other packages in there, service discovery as well. So that's the that's the split as I describe it. Yeah, I was trying to figure that out whether what the boundaries were for each of the pain. Yeah, and I could probably do a much better job of um, sort of giving introductory uh, on ramp style documentation on the website. Right now, I've been so focused on sort of the advanced use cases, I've kind of let that atrophy a little bit. So I'll I'll put that in my queue. <laughs> cool. So I think that we are basically out of time. But did anybody want to talk about um, JBD's new tool before we roll this thing out? Because that, that's freaking cool. The GOPS tool. I wonder how, I wonder how you, it's supposed to be pronounced. Yeah, I was wondering. <laughs> I think it's GOPS. But it's, I'd say GOPS. Yeah, like this really cool debug tool for Go processes on your machine. So like you can, you can run like GOPS stack and pass it the PID of a Go process and you can actually see the current stack and you can get GC information and memory statistics from a running Go process. Yeah, it's something I haven't been able to use in anger yet, but I'm super <laughs> excited. I'm super excited about the potential here because we all know like Go processes are really introspectable in theory, but I can't be the only one like when looking at something in a staging environment, for example, and like having to remember how to piece together the call graph from whatever endpoints happen to be exposed. The idea of like a single unified kind of uh, introspection tool or interface to an arbitrary process is really exciting to me, and um, I'm I'm really keen to 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 take it uh, to the limit at some point. Yeah, that's kind of the fun thing about having a runtime is that all this stuff exists in there. You just kind of got to poke at it, and I've only used this from like poking and prodding things that are running just out of sure sure like curiosity and playing. But again, like I, I look forward to trying to like where I actually have a use case for it or in the middle of debugging, I don't want to, you know, have to take down the process. I just want to prod it. I think Scott disappeared on us. Where where you been at, Scott? No, I'm, I'm still here. I was actually looking at the code uh, while you all were talking. It looks like you have to install an agent in the processes that you want to introspect so that it'll open this uh, Unix socket uh, in the temp directory so that the Go PS uh, program can actually go inspect things um, by talking over that socket. So it doesn't seem like it's uh, built in quite uh, as much as. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, it's not. Yeah, it's it's should definitely clarify that it's not that you can take any run and go process and do that. Oh, yeah. It's works similar to the way like you can expose the runtime stats over HTTP. There's kind of a library for it, but this is kind of. Uh, adds more functionality than just exporting the what do you how's the package pronounced xpvar xvar yeah yeah like you look at these things you're like how so when somebody named this how did they pronounce it you know pronunciation just wasn't important at the time mm -hmm. so it's like i i have two words how do i how do i make it one word here we go xpvar <laughs> i i love hearing people's pronunciations of stuff so peter like you use kubernetes do you call it kube cuddle? Kube cuddle, yeah, sure. See, yeah, I don't do that. It's it's kube control or kube CTL. I, I've never called it kube cuddle, but people call it that all the time. I like I like kube CTL too, but I like kube cuddle because it it it's like a, a Cthulhu kind of angle to it, which is generally how I feel when I'm programming. So does that work for system D too? It's system cuddle and 
etcd cuddle yeah exactly does it make you feel better that you're trying to diagnose something i'm just going to cuddle it <laughs> well it, it like maps it, it it feels coherent to me like like when i think cuddle i think like the squid like C C cthulhu coming to devour the world and typically when i'm debugging something I feel like my mind is being devoured by all the bad decisions I've made that led me up to that point. So it, it, it lines up, is what I'm saying. Oh. Did anybody have any other uh, interesting projects or news they wanted to go over before we wrap the show up? Do we have time? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't have anywhere to be. I want to give a shout out to uh, Gotham Go and everybody that's in New York City this weekend. Yes. Hope everybody has a great time. I wish I could be there. I'm traveling too much, though. Yeah. Are you Are you going, Scott or Peter? Uh, no, I've been to too, way too many conferences recently. I need to actually uh, get some work done. Same. <laughs> Same here. That's basically where I'm at. It's like I just got back from a conference. Well, apparently, uh, I have a few things to go through, but somebody cut me off. There is no time. Uh, there is the Go fonts. So the Go team came up with this new font that's meant for Go code. It's on the, on the blog. There's a blog post about it. It shows how, how the font looks like. It seems okay. It seems okay to me. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't seen this. It seems a bit, uh, when I look at it, it feels to me antiquated, but. It's, it's hard though. Cause like, I'm, I've never been like a, a font zealot, you know, like, yeah. There's people who are like really, really big into fonts and like they can they can look at this font and be like, oh, that's this style. And I've just never it, it's either easy on the eyes or it's not like that's as far as my font knowledge goes. What did you think, Peter and Scott? I'd be curious. Scott, you want to go first? Uh, sure. I didn't really spend a whole lot of time looking at it. I mean, it's like trying to get somebody to change their religion practically if you want me to change the font on my editor uh, better have a good reason or we can go to war but like it, it's the same idea for me like I, I don't i don't have any reason even to to try and adopt it i think the the font that i use right now is is fine i've been using it for years and, and uh, i don't feel like that font is actually more readable for me so that's where i am how about you peter i would guess i would classify myself as an amateur font person i know about serifs and kerning and x heights and all that stuff and i actually ran the font by one of my semi-professional typeface nerds and like unfortunately there's a lot wrong with it um the kerning is pretty bad the differentiation in the weights is pretty bad i mean i don't want to dump on somebody's work or anything but it's not it's not a good font man it's it's not great <laughs> i'd love to see like somebody explain that because that's the hard thing is like visually it's just to me it's either appealing or it's not and i'd love to see like why like yeah. actually get a breakdown like our brain our nerd brains work that way like okay this is bad but why yeah yeah uh maybe offline we can look into that yeah and, and maybe you know it's good for some people but for, it's a matter of taste somebody had the taste to come up with it and i saw a lot of people resonating with it and liking it and uh, i'm a font illiterate i, I don't know type so when I look at it, I, my gut reaction is uh, don't do much for me, but I like the idea. It's hard for me because it's like if I change my font to anything else, I, I feel like I might as well be diff writing in a different language. Like, what are these weird characters? <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's hard to get your eyes to adjust when you stare at code so much. It's just even slightly different. Yeah. Yeah, it, it has a great uh, impact when you change anything. That's why it's so horrible when you interview and you have to code in somebody else's computer or somebody or an online editor. I totally get lost. I was like, I don't even know what's happening. It's just, it's not my editor. I can't function. <laughs> and it, it, it doesn't have to be very far off too to feel that out of your element. You know, one hotkey you're expecting doesn't work and you're like, I'm ruined. <laughs> I can't <Exactly>. code. <laughs> we, we're very fragile creatures. <laughs> for all the adoption of new technology that we like we're still very stuck in our ways in other places mm -hmm. but i think that has a lot to do with it there's so much change in around us we need to have a core that's fixed that's our safety blanket <laughs> change everything but don't change my environment don't change my editor yeah 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I've been using the same editor I've been using for, I don't even know, 10, 15, 15 years, something like that. Wow. So I, I just can't, I can't, I can't cut the cord. I see new editors and I'm like, well, that looks cool. And I just can't cut the cord. <laughs> I feel like I got to get work done. I can't, you know, I can't afford to try to learn a new editor. <laughs> So uh, did we have anything else or we want to move into Free Software Friday? Um, Peter, do you have any interesting projects or news to mention? I don't have any projects, but I kind of want to exploit your audience for this thing that's been bouncing around in my head a little bit lately. Can I do that or is that totally yeah. Yeah. not a proposal? Okay. No, so we all, know, we all know Prometheus, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. This... Um, instrumentation and monitoring service and it's like among its many benefits i think one of the greatest things for me is that it's so operationally simple you just run the binary it scrapes your jobs there's no cluster there's no distributed file system it just kind of does what it says on the tin when i when i give the microservice workshop i say you should definitely be using prometheus because it's so great but then people ask me what should i be using for logs and as far as i know there isn't really a good answer for this i mean most people say use the elk stack right the elastic search log stash kibana stack or i guess it's called the elastic stack now but if you ever tried to operate an elastic search cluster you you know it's not easy in fact it's like notoriously difficult so i'm wondering what it, a prometheus for logs would look like architecturally operationally and if maybe there's already a product out there that i just don't know about i mean i've done a lot of research maybe there's something that exists I would love to like have people ping me maybe on Twitter with their ideas. That's interesting. I mean, what about GoKit log? So GoKit log is about how you manage logging within your um, process, within your service itself. What I'm kind of curious about is once the log information leaves the process boundary, like on standard out, say, how do you get that into a system that is like searchable and usable operationally simply and, um, you know, without having to deal with Elasticsearch effectively. Okay, so are you talking about what Prometheus is for metrics? You're talking about that for logging? Yeah, something like that at a very high level. Have you looked at things like Logstash or? Yeah, so Logstash is like, it's like a FluentD thing where it's like um, kind of pushing logs around, but it's not actually doing any storing or querying. Okay, so you kind of want to address this from like the there's lots of stuff out there for kind of doing metrics and alerting and, and things like that. You want kind of like a, something that's designed specifically for log storage. Like if we had to rethink distributed log transfer and storage and querying today, what would that look like? Not exactly. an implementation built on top of something that exists, but like completely new effort. What would that look like? Exactly. And maybe there's already software that's like purpose built for exactly what I'm thinking and I can just use it. And if so, that's great. I'd love to know about it, but I don't. So you're talking about in Go, yeah? Or well, just in general? Like in general would be fine. The only thing in the space that I'm aware of that like serves this need is Elasticsearch. And I'd, it's like too operationally tricky. And some other reasons I won't get into. I'm I'm not a big fan of it for this use case. But um, yeah, like maybe something in Go, that would be great. Now, Scott has a different opinion on log storage. Netflix doesn't do a lot of the distributed logs. You want to speak to that a little bit, Scott? Um, so I would probably need to clarify that. We do have a massive logging system um, that we generate a ton of logs, um, but I don't. <laughs> so uh, as a company, we're sort of this logging, you know, it's the same old joke. We're a logging system with the side effect of streaming video. And... <laughs> There's a there's a massive Kafka cluster that's the ingest for this, and I believe that is um, has some processing after that it goes into uh, HDFS, I imagine. Yeah, but mm, my view is like we I tend to try not to rely on logs and just keep metrics around everything that I could possibly want to introspect. Um, totally. And if there's some specific thing that I like, it, it's it's like bucketize all unknown errors, then yeah, we'll start logging something. But at that point, like there's no performance hit because I'm going to close the connection anyway. So yeah, that's my little speech. <laughs> it's difficult when you get at scale like that because you can't, you can't look, log into the servers and check the logs anymore, right? So you kind of have, like you said, metrics, and then you have the log messages that you want to be alerted on. So there's kind of like these different reasons you want logs. You want uh, like to you want to diagnose a distributed trace, basically a request through the system. 
and see like what happened for that. You want kind of generic aggregate summaries of things that are going on in the health of your system, which metrics solve. And you want alerts so that when particular things happen, you can be notified of them. I think that solves most of the use cases for um, like at scale logging. Many. Because I think it gets too hard. You know, can anybody think of any other use cases that it, like a system like this would need to solve? I mean, certainly uh, I, I cut the logging domain into two parts. One is like your typical debug info warn application logging where you, and you might need this kind of um, deep introspection in order to debug certain issues. Um, but you don't need a high quality of service. You can drop some of those log messages and it's not going to be the end of the world. But then there's this other thing, I call it audit logging. Maybe it has a different name to di in different contexts where it's like, uh, if you're running Netflix, you want to uh, see, or let's say you're running a bank, um, you want to see every time somebody makes a deposit or a credit. Uh, this stuff is critical to your business. You need like durable, um, reliable uh, logs of all of these sort of transactions. And um, that probably needs to end up somewhere reliably. And both of these things is sort of what I'm considering, although they are like drastically different um, QoS guarantees. Well, let's talk about structure versus unstructural logging. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 That's a whole show, right? There. Uh, the, the gloves come off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we want to move on to Free Software Friday. So in case we didn't tell you, Peter, uh -oh. so we try to kind of to to um your point early on with the that you don't really hear from people when all is going well. So we try to every episode kind of just throw out a project and thank them. It does not it does not have to be written in Go. Uh, it can be a person, group, or project. Um, and just kind of thank them for, you know, providing stuff that makes our lives easier. So if you can't think of anything, you don't have to, but we'll, we'll, we'll put you as last. That way you have time to think of something. Great. Thanks. All right. So Carlisi, you want to go first? Oh, gee, no, I don't have anything today. Okay. <laughs> How about you, Scott? Uh, sure. Uh, last week I went to QCon in San Francisco, which is um, a really amazing conference, actually. It's really high quality. And I went to one talk on Twitter's caching system, uh, which naturally I was interested in because I work on the Netflix caching system. Uh, and they have written their own C-based uh, cache called Pelican that is basically, it speaks Memcached, but it's entirely different from the inside. And this talk that they, they gave was all about all these different things that can go wrong, which informed the design of this new cache. Um, and their Pelican cache is actually open source. The, the link I just will put in the show notes, but I can paste it in Slack now. But there's all kinds of things, like they use a static size hash table because uh, they used to see these latency spikes at exponentially increasing intervals, which happen to correspond with hash table expansion um, and a variety of things like that. The talk was really cool. Um, unfortunately, QCon talks take a while to come out, so it probably won't be around for a while. Uh, but the project itself is, is really cool. Oh, cool. So it was recorded? It'll be out eventually. Eventually. I, I don't know when, unfortunately. I have access to the videos because I attended, but... but uh... I'll brag about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to give you a little more time, uh, Peter, I'll go next. So I have not used this. I'll preface it with this. I have not used this yet, but I was at KubeCon last week, and I was talking to the CoreOS guys, and they, they have a really cool project. It's called ZCD. And it's basically a bridge between Zookeeper, Wire compatible, and etcd. So, like, if you use things that are backed by Zookeeper, like Kafka and things like that, um, you could actually wire this thing up in between and have it talk to etcd instead. And I thought that that was like ridiculously cool because I've never been fond of managing uh, Zookeeper clusters. And I will drop that in the channel too for anybody who is listening live. All right, Peter, you have anything? And feel free to say no. No, I've got one. I've got one. Um, and it's a small thing, but sometimes the small things are the best things. Uh, I was using grep for most of my life until I stumbled over this program called ACK, which was a bit more usable version of grep. Um, and I was using that for a long time until I stumbled over this thing called the Platinum Searcher. And uh, there's a turns out there's a Go implementation of it. 
which I've been using for the past couple of months with uh, a lot of success. And so I will also drop a link into the Slack for that one. Uh, you can install it and it installs as PT and you can use it like a uh, grep, except you don't have to do weird contortions with dash R and it kind of grep like you expect it should work. And it's super, super fast. So um, yeah, PT. I'm glad you mentioned that because <laughs> Dave Cheney mentioned it and I was like, I'm going to install it immediately. And I never did, but now I'm going to start it immediately. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the same boat. I, I use the silver searcher for, for many years now and it's still installed. And people keep reminding me of the Platinum Searcher. And I'm like, I'm going to use that. <laughs> and then I go along my way and continue to mm -hmm. build stuff. And I forget all about it. So now it's going gonna, it's gonna to live in my sea of tabs until either my computer shuts down and I lose the tab or I actually install it. All right. So I think with that, we are out of time. And I definitely want to thank uh, everybody on the panel. Thank you, Scott, for stepping in. And thank you, for Peter, for coming on the show. Uh, thanks to everybody who's listening now and who will be listening to us uh, when the recording is released. Huge thank you to our sponsors, Minio and Backtrace. Uh, definitely share the show with your friends, family, colleagues. Um, we are GoTimeFM on Twitter, GoTime.FM. Uh, you can go to, to subscribe. And if you want to be on the show or have ideas for the show or just questions of the hosts or um, guests, uh, hit us up on github.com slash go time FM slash ping. And with that, uh, goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next week. This was fun. Bye. Thanks, Peter. Bye bye. I had a heckin' good time. Thanks, everyone. A heckin' good time. <laughs> <laughs>